The Great Atlantic and Pacific Tea Company, better known as AMP, was an American chain of grocery stores that operated from 1859 to 2015. Welcome back to my channel. If you haven't already, please hit that subscribe button and notification bell to so get notified of my latest video. Please hit that like button and leave a suggestion or a comment. You might see that in a future video. Thanks for watching and now back to our regular scheduled program. The company's history traces to 1859 when George F. Gilman and George Huntington Hartford founded the Great American Tea Company in New York City to trade in tea bought from cargoes off the clipper ships. That same year, George Huntington Hartford and George Francis Gilman formed a partnership. Using Gilman's connections as an established grocer and the son of a wealthy ship owner, Hartford purchased coffee and tea from clipper ships on the waterfront docks of New York City. By eliminating brokers, Hartford and Gilman were able to sell their wares at cargo prices. Initially, the operation was strictly a mail order affair, but the enterprise proved so successful that Hartford and Gilman opened a series of stores under the name Great American Tea Company. The first of these, which opened in 1861, soon became a landmark on Vesey Street in New York City. By 1869, there were 11 such stores. The company's appeal to the 19th century consumer was enhanced by the lavish storefronts and Chinese-inspired interiors that Gilman designed. Inside the Chinese-paneled walls, cockatoos greeted customers who brought their purchases to a pagoda-shaped cash desk. Outside the red and gold storefronts were illuminated by dozens of gaslights that formed a giant T. On Saturdays, customers were treated to the music of a live brass band. Its success was largely due to its innovative strategy of offering savings and incentives to the consumer. AMP's club plan, introduced in 1866, which encouraged the formation of clubs to make bulk mail order sales for an additional one third discount, was so successful that by 1886, hundreds of such clubs had been formed. In 1869, Gilman created a parallel company, the Great Atlantic and Pacific Tea Company, to promote the then new concept of prepackaged tea under the Tea Nectar name. The tea company continued to use the Great American name for mail order purposes. In 1871, AMP introduced another concept when it offered premiums such as lithographs, china, and glassware with the purchase of coffee and or tea at its stores. These premiums are now collectibles. The company was renamed Great Atlantic and Pacific Tea Company in 1870. In 1875, AMP had stores in 16 cities. By 1878, the firm operated 70 lavish equipped stores and a mail order business with combined annual sales of $1 million. By 1881, its stores extended as far west as St. Paul, Minnesota, and as far south as Richmond and Norfolk. Virginia. Soon, coffee, spices, and extracts were added to the sales. In the 1890s, the great AMP was shifting from a tea company to a grocery chain. In 1900, it operated almost 200 stores. AMP dramatically grew by introducing the economy store concept in 1912. The economy store was designed to operate at 12% gross margin, capitalized at only $3,000, including its initial investment. The prototype store operated with only a manager and without fancy fixtures. After World War I, it added stores that offered meat and produce while expanding manufacturing. In 1925, it operated 13,961 stores. In 1930, now the world's largest retailer, the corporation's 16,000 stores reached $2.9 billion in sales, 
resulting in a 25% grocery store share in its operating areas and about 10% nationwide. No retail company had ever achieved these results. AMP was twice as large as the next largest retailer, Sears, and four times that of grocer Kroger. Unlike most of its competitors, AMP was in an excellent position to weather the Great Depression. The Hartfords built their chain without borrowing. Their low price format resulted in even higher sales. In 1936, it adopted the self-service market concept and opened 4,000 larger stores while phasing out many of its smaller units. The new stores proved to be very successful, and in 1938, it operated 1,100 supermarkets. During the 30s, the Hartfords also decided to expand into manufacturing. This was a pretty dramatic idea. The idea was that AMP could buy bakeries, could buy salmon canneries, could buy vegetable canning plants, dairy plants, and the company could run these to supply its stores. Controlling both the retail store and the supply chain gave the AMP a huge advantage over corner grocery stores because the AMP could run the factories at a lower cost. In addition, AMP started to bypass wholesalers and go directly to distributors for various products. In 1936, the Robinson Patman Act was passed, marking the beginning of the antitrust woes that shook AMP's hegemony. Anti chain store legislation passed as the instigation of small, independent grocers who claim chains practice unfair competition imposed severe taxes and regulations on AMP and other chains, limiting pricing and other competitive advantages afforded to them by virtue of their size and purchasing power. The company sought to redeem its damaged public image by publicizing its sense of corporate responsibility to consumers, producers, and employees. The loss of a suit in 1949, however, imposed limitations on AMP's purchasing practices that were more severe than any others in the industry. With this final blow, the company's position as an esteemed industry leader disintegrated. AMP's decline began in the early 1950s when it failed to keep pace with competitors that opened larger supermarkets. Some of these factors were that AMP was starved of capital. While AMP was publicly traded, most of AMP's product profit was declared as dividends to satisfy the income needs of the trust and its heirs. AMP also placed too much emphasis on private label products. In 1951, the Supreme Court ruled that manufacturers could not establish minimum prices unless the retailer agreed to the arrangement. This decision launched a revolution in discount retailing fueled by the rapid increase in television advertising that raised demand for national brands. Another factor was AMP's labor costs were higher than those of most competitors. Because AMP stopped growing, a rising percent of its workers were making higher wages due to their seniority. To offset the higher labor costs, AMP tried to operate stores with fewer employees, resulting in long lines at checkout and empty shelves. AMP tried to boost store traffic and sales by reintroducing trading stamps, creating AMP's plaid stamps. By the 1970s, AMP was losing ground to its competitors. They implemented a strategy to substantially cut prices by converting AMP to a warehouse store concept that became known as WEO, or Warehouse Economy Outlet. The problem was that most AMPs were not large enough to properly implement the program. Losses quickly mounted. AMP exited California and Washington State in 1971 and 1974 respectively, making Missouri its westernmost reach. AMP closed 1,500 stores during the mid-1970s, reducing it to 1,978 units. Numerous executives were hired from outside and pushed authority down to the regional level. During that span, AMP built 300 supermarkets ranging from 23,000 square feet to 32,000 square feet along with the first combination grocery store drug
AMP sold its 237-store Canadian division, consisting of AMP Dominion, Ultra Food and Drug Stores, as well as Canadian Food Basics Units, to Montreal-based Metro Inc. In 2007, AMP acquired Pathmark for $1.4 billion. The 2008 recession had hit many supermarkets as customers migrated to discount markets in even greater numbers. AMP was especially hit hard because of its increased debt load to complete the Pathmark purchase. In December of 2010, AMP announced it was filing for Chapter 11 bankruptcy. AMP listed over $2.5 billion in assets to $3.2 billion in debt. AMP emerged from bankruptcy in 2012. The next year, AMP was put up for sale, but they could not find a suitable buyer. On July 19, 2015, AMP filed for Chapter 11 bankruptcy protection again, immediately closing 25 underperforming stores. The company up to this point had 296 stores. Parts of the company were sold to other chains, and the rest were closed by November 25, 2015. The Clifton Path Marks plastered with signs, store closing. It's one of 10 New Jersey supermarkets owned by A&P that will shut down, with dozens more slated to be sold this year after their corporate parent declared bankruptcy. Many customers have shopped here for years, and they feel emotional. Everybody angry. Everybody's angry? Yeah. But it was, we got no store over here, no place. I've been shopping at Pathmark one or the other for many, many years, and I was very happy with it. I'm very sad to hear it. You're going to lose your job here? Yeah, we got laid off. Do you know where you're going? Uh, right now I'm supplying. A&P struggled with its cash flow. This is the supermarket conglomerate's second bankruptcy in five years. As other retailers, like Walmart, opened grocery sections with discount food, they carted off A&P's market share. An undercover market guru, Matthew Casey, claims A&P got left holding the empty grocery bag. Is there a failure to... Uh, react to the competition, their failure to keep up with current trends, and, and they just let competition come in and, for lack of a better phrase, eat their lunch. They did nothing to fight, and it finally caught up to them. Shoppers with boots on the ground confirmed Casey's observation. Because ShopRite, they give better sales than Pathmark. So they like always in competition. Like if Pathmark got it for five, ShopRite got it for three. A&P sent layoff notices to employees at 93 New Jersey stores named Pathmark, A&P, and Superfresh. Some 870 workers will be gone by September, and thousands more received notice they'd be let go around Thanksgiving. But it's misleading to think they'll all be jobless, say union officials who represent store workers. It's not numbers. It's people. It's lives. And our responsibility is to try and do our very best to get as many of our members re-employed as possible. Union President John Nikolai says A&P's already sold more than 40 stores to chains like Acme, and many workers will probably get rehired by new employers in Tier 1 of the settlement process. We'll be placing about 4,000 of our 7,000 members, and then we're going to go into Tier 2, where other employers will come in to bid on these stores. He's not sure how many workers will ultimately end up jobless, and the union's still negotiating whether members will earn the same wages or less. A&P sent letters to its customers explaining it all, including which stores will close and how to find the closest alternative. Some people who got car, what they go, to walk? Yeah. Five, six miles for that store? It's uh, sorry. In 1912, AMP opened its first discount store in Jersey City. This supermarket is going to be one of its last. It's slated to close next month. A corporate spokesman declined comment. In Clifton, I'm Brenda Flanagan, NJTV News. Hey, if you just watched my video, thanks for watching. Hit that like button and please subscribe to Eric C. Productions.